What's up, Cuba? How you living? Same, man. Glad you can make it. Mic check, mic check. Can everybody hear me okay? You guys at the top, all the way in the back, front row, we're good. Thank you guys for joining me again. Some of you uh, were here earlier for my pr first presentation on the secrets to trophy bass fishing. And hopefully you guys got some good insight from that. We're gonna have a little bit more fun now and kind of take it backwards. We're gonna talk about fundamentals of fishing uh, to its most fundamental level. So those of you guys that aren't familiar with who I am, my name is Oliver Nye. I hail from the West Coast and I make a living going to new bodies of water, trying to catch as many and the biggest fish that I can come across. And it's a, it's a really unique opportunity for me to come back through this part of the country. I've utilized techniques with this very bait here actually, with success in New Jersey and New York, with bass. Uh, and really what sets me up for a lure like this is a lot of the fundamentals. Okay, this is something I feel the, the fishing culture recently ignores and overlooks and the importance of it. So we're just gonna go through some smaller uh, lure styles that lead to hopefully you guys chasing and living big bass dreams of your own. Okay, this is a big bait to most people. It can be very, very intimidating. Especially if you showed this lure to a, a young version of myself. I mean, I was a dreamer, but I also would have thought you were crazy and full of it if you're telling me you're trying to catch a bass out of my local lake. People have this perception that the grass is always greener on the other side because man, where I fish is tough. Like it gets hammered by tournaments. It sees a lot of pressure. I've been fishing for 20 years. I've never seen one over seven pounds, whatever it is. So that must mean that it's easier where I'm seeing fish catchers on social media. Oh, California has got to be better than New York, Texas, Florida. But the funny thing is I tow a 20 foot bass boat all the way from LA to come fish your greener grass. So it, it, think about that for a second. The fact that your fish aren't seeing this on a consistent basis really leaves that door wide open for someone like me or some of the guys in this region who are starting to catch on and see success. But the biggest, biggest factor that leads to those hero moments that you guys may be watching on the Big Bass Streams channel or my own personal YouTube channel, uh, they're all cemented in fundamental bass fishing techniques, okay? We got a little bit of a mega bass presence in the building here. We got any mega bass fans in the house? Raise your hands. Yeah. Well, you guys are definitely ahead of the curve. Any of you guys familiar with this little bad boy? Mega bass dark sleeper? Oh gosh. They love this thing. Look at that. Look at that big smile. That brings back some good memories, huh? <laughs> That's terrible. Don't use it. No, yeah. I mean, how many bites have I made? I haven't even made a cast. This is a fundamental style of fishing, right? And the lessons here are that I'm getting a ton of engagement. I'm getting a lot of learning opportunities. Okay, I can go out there and get X amount of bites on this thing versus if I go out there with that eight inch swim bait, I'm ultimately only fishing for the biggest bass in that lake. I mean, that's the mindset I'm going out with. So if I do everything right, I'm gonna get one shot. There isn't a whole lot of opportunity there to learn. Okay, how should I cast the bait? Where should I present the bait? Do I set the hook? Do I just wind? Do I let it sit there? Do I swim it? Am I going too fast? Oh, look at that. Positive engagement and reinforcement from the fish on a smaller scale. Does that make sense at all? I'm getting lots of opportunities to learn and unfortunately, the truth of the matter is, the best way to learn is through mistakes. So I could be getting bites and then swinging too fast, pulling the bait away from the fish. What have you guys noticed about what I'm doing thus far? I haven't swung one time. You notice how long those fish are holding onto this thing? Like, they don't want to spit it. It's a soft plastic lure, it's gummy in feel. 
the dorsal fin actually hides the hook on this bait. And then if you put scent on, on top of that feel, now you're appealing to two different senses. Positive reinforcement. Oh, this feels right. Oh, this tastes like garlic. I like this. I don't know why they like garlic. Uh, but that really encourages them to hold on to it even more. And honestly, if you take too long, they can actually swallow the lure. It's kind of a good problem to deal with, right? But then you should make adjustments from there. You should be swinging a little bit quicker. But you're gonna get a ton of learning opportunities. And this is a very versatile bait. And those lack of hands uh, really perplexes me. Because I don't know about you guys, but I like catching fish. I don't know what the rest of you guys are doing. This is a pretty special deal. <laughs> I can't even focus because these things just want to murder this. Like, I, I might have to try to catch one without actually hooking it. This is an interesting phenomenon. Okay, this is a very versatile bait in that you literally can't fish it wrong. Let's see if I can pull this off. You guys think I can do this? I'm getting a little sidetracked here. <laughs> you may actually need to hand line it. Look at this. You don't even need a fishing rod. Come on, guys. Oh. oh. That was close. I mean, as you guys can see from this bait, literally just putting it in the water, letting it fall, letting it sink a little bit, it's doing a lot. Let's see if they'll eat it suspended. I actually haven't tried that. I'm gonna ask that question. It's generally, it's obviously piquing their interest, but they definitely want it moving in this case, all right? But that dynamic changes if I let it fall all the way to the bottom. If you guys, I welcome you guys to come up close to the glass and really observe this uh, up close if you like. This is a very rare and unique perspective that we don't really get, right? There's a, a lot of perception going off in here and that surface of the water is a boundary to the reality of what may be going on in there. Man, young dreamers, you guys are the best. I love it. You can actually see how these fish are reacting and engaging with your presentation. Okay, that's why clear water is uh, very important for some people. It gives you another clue and a, and a visual connection to the fish where you can read their body language. You know, I got a cohort here who's been giving seminars with his dogs and he's actually demonstrating a lot of the same behavior with, with his dogs that the fish and every other predatory animal exhibits. All right, they're curious. They have to investigate. And really, it's up to the angler to really articulate some kind of illusion of life and trigger a response. And it doesn't take much with this. I, I'm totally distracted talking to you guys. I've got the bait in the water. I'm lifting it once in a while. I'm letting it fall. And I'm getting plenty of engagement. So one of the concepts that I, that I grew up fishing that I picked up really early and has stuck with me this entire time is I'm gonna try asking those fish a particular question five or 10 times, especially if it's an area that I know those fish are frequenting. Okay, that's gonna give me a, a body of uh, engagement and it'll let me know whether or not those fish like the question I'm asking them, right? We want a yes. I'm getting a lot of yes right now. It's really hard to mess up. But if I'm not getting that kind of engagement, let go, let go. Okay, I could be trying my first set of questions. Let me see if I just wind this thing as soon as it hits the water. Are they aggressive enough to eat this bait? Oh yeah, cool, that's pretty good. I don't even need to let it sink. Cast it out there, wind it in, keep catching fish. All of a sudden that slows down. Like, oh man, I picked off the two or three aggressive ones in this school. All right, let's change the question a little bit. I'm gonna count down to two. Now I'm gonna swim this thing mid column and ask a slightly different question. Let's see, oh, okay, that's a good solid yes. You guys see where I'm going here? It's a process of elimination. And this goes all the way up the line to using these. And instead of, you know, medium sized dreams, <laughs> they become big bass dreams, hopefully. But these are your learning opportunities. Okay, so this is a mega bass dark sleeper. What do you guys think? 
Are you guys predators? Oh yeah. Oh, 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 same concept. <laughs> and if you guys notice the way that I was fishing that thing, you can literally take all of those same lessons that we discussed and hopefully that you're learning from and upscale it. All right, you got an eight inch soft bait, gummy, covered in scent. I use Vast Dynasty so that when I do get that one biggest fish in the lake, and that could be daunting if you're fishing Lake Ontario or Cayuga or Champlain, but that's the mindset I'm going out there with, guys. That's the difference. I'm really looking for that one split second mistake and I need to capitalize on it. So whether that fish eats it with a solid thunk or if it just gets mushy and I can recognize that mushy, spongy pressure bite. Are you guys familiar with that term, a pressure bite? Where you're not getting that telltale tick or thump and you just go like lift on your bait and you're like, nah, man, that, that doesn't feel right. Well, you'll recognize that a fish has already got your bait. You can wind down, swing, hopefully uh, start missing some high fives and almost falling out of the boat in celebration. But if you aren't paying attention to all those lessons that can be learned through the fundamental styles of bass fishing, you're probably gonna screw that up. All right, and then of course, you're the one that had the 11 or 12 pound largemouth in New York State for sure. It's the biggest thing you'd ever seen. But where's the pictures? Well, it got away. Or it came off. Like, oh, okay, I've heard this story. So you guys see a lot of that same parallel there in the way I was presenting that bait. And believe it or not, letting this thing just sit there for a very long time is one of my most effective techniques. Even the way this thing is falling, Senko and uh, weightless worm fishermen in the house. You guys see something real similar there? Okay, so I'm gonna be ready when I cast this bait on a prime piece of cover, like a log that I've identified big fish use, and watch my line as that bait's sinking and shashing. It's gonna hit the bottom. If I'm not bit on the bottom after whatever question I'm asking, like how long do I let it sit there? Do I, let, do I immediately begin my retrieve and presentation now, or do I let it sit there? Do I lift it up high so I can get a burst and potentially a reaction strike? Or do they want it on that slow fall? Those are the questions I'm consistently asking these fish, changing it up, and really staying flexible in my mindset. Man, that looks good. <laughs> I should be showing you guys more of the fundamental stuff, but I'm, I'm just kind of drawn to this, if you guys can't tell. All right, and I think a lot of you guys are too, because every time I come back to the Northeast, I get more and more people that are experiencing some of this stuff in your local waters, and uh, it, it's something truly special. So hopefully that trend continues. Mega Bass fans, you guys know this thing, right? How about the rest of you guys? For the most part, this is a finesse swim bait on a jig head. You guys are all pretty familiar with jig heads, right? Molded weight onto a hook, and then you typically attach some kind of soft plastic trailer on here. What do you think, impressed or not so much? Because I like the sweater. You think they'll eat this? Oh, I have, <laughs> apparently you guys, are, uh, you guys are fishing past lives. Here, let me see what this thing is all about. Oh, look at that, another bite. Okay, small finesse bait, high engagement rate, and this is literally the same bait as this eight inch swim bait, this 10 inch swim bait. They're both swim baits. Look at the swimming mechanisms on both these lures. Literally the same thing, just a lot bigger. Catch fish the same way, hopefully just a lot bigger. But you'd be amazed at the size of fish we catch on these sometimes. I mean, fish smaller than it, that are in the tank today. Bass are, are pretty uh, brazen predators. Okay, so I'm gonna go out there in the hopes of learning enough to be able to confidently utilize that big, big swim bait. Okay, I'm gonna go out there with a three inch swim bait and I'm gonna learn how to catch, this, catch fish on this thing in any and all conditions. Same set of questions, right? I'm gonna start shallow, I'm gonna start pretty fast and aggressive and just judge <laughs> Judge the mood of these fish. Am I gonna get some yes answers? And apparently these guys are willing to eat this thing right away. Oh, 
If I had some sense, I definitely could pull this off. <laughs> Sorry guys, I keep getting distracted. I am still a fisherman at heart. All right, and I'm gonna just go through the motions, get a ton of bites, catch a lot of fish, and learn, and learn, and learn, and make adjustments when I fail. But this thing's gonna give me a lot of opportunities to make those failures at a relatively low cost. For the most part, you're gonna catch a lot of school-sized fish with this, unless you got big, big smallmouth around. We've caught a vast majority of our five plus pound, six pound, seven plus pound smallmouth on this diminutive uh, little lure. So you, once in a while, you can get elephants to eat peanuts, but for the most part, you're playing a numbers game. It's gonna appeal to a wider size range of fish. So you're gonna catch a lot of the smaller ones, but I mean, that's kind of a good problem to have, right? Having to weed through too many two to six pound fish. My man, Vinny, you know what's up. <laughs> so I'm gonna just go out there, have fun, and but pay attention to all the details and the mechanics, right? Man, should I be swinging and setting the hook on this? Well, I don't know, try it. How does that work out for you? Oh gosh, there was one right there. Typically for me, this is a wind set. I learned that my odds of hooking that fish, landing that fish, go way up if I actually just use the reel to set the hook. The big difference is I'm actually fishing braided main lines to a short fluorocarbon leader. So there's, there's very little stretch here. I don't really need to, to pay homage to the great Bill Dance with one of those big little boat rocking hook sets with this. It's actually counterproductive. And as much as I love setting the hook, if you guys watch enough frog fishing videos of mine or big swim, soft plastic swim bait videos, like I got a pretty distinct hook set where it literally goes all the way up from my toes, like into their soul. Like it's a lot of fun. But more, more than that f sensation and feeling, I like catching that fish even more. So there are scenarios that I'm taking experience from, like this little guy, or fishing a smaller hard bait that translate all the way up to the big scale. So I'm kind of bummed that they uh, scheduled my seminars in reverse today, because I actually kind of like building you guys up with this stuff, and then showing you guys the, you know, the real trophy mindset stuff. But honestly, it's kind of the same thing to a degree. Now you Northeast guys are, are really, really famous for being incredible jerkbait fishermen. We got jerkbait fishermen in the house. Raise your hands. Nice. Probably mega bass fanatics at the same time. That doesn't take long for that to, to develop. My man Q in the back. <laughs> Drove four hours all the way to get here, man. I appreciate you guys. The rest of you guys, once again, do you not like catching fish? This is a fishing convention. You should be coming and learning as much as you can to catch some fish. This is a highly productive bait, my man. It's called the Mega Bass Vision 110. Do not forget that. And I can say with confidence that I believe this to be one of the top five bass fishing lures ever invented. Plastic Worm 110. Man, look at you guys. Your enthusiasm is infectious. This is a perfect lead-in to a glide bait. Okay, this seems like a monster bait. All right, especially when you compare it to a little jerk bait like this. And then you step up to this bad boy. Okay, now, you, now you're being serious, hopefully. And you're prepared, because this guy will drastically reduce the number of fish that you're gonna engage with, but the size differential goes way off the charts. Okay, I, I, I fished a, a pretty high pressure lake uh, that I grew up on back in Southern California. I got a lot of pressure. It took a lot of light line, finesse techniques, small worms. This is predating fluorocarbon, the brush hog, the Senko. Oh gosh, this braid revolution back then it was only spider wire. It was five pound mono, little worms. There was no tungsten. Like this is going back. And we really prided ourselves on being efficient finesse fishermen. Um, so the name of the game was just to catch as many fish as I could. Oh, look at me. How much did your best five weigh? Because everything was kind of 
only tournament focus. All this stuff that we have available to us now didn't really exist. So that was the way you measured yourself against the other guys that you're fishing on. And as many hundreds, maybe thousands of fish that I would catch, I can remember on one hand how many largemouth, even in California, that I caught that were over six pounds. Like it wasn't very many. So you, you start building this picture of your head, uh, this perception that, that is totally disconnected from the reality of what's under the surface. Because once I actually really committed to learning a big bait and throwing only a big bait, holy beep, the, the numbers of fish, five, six, seven, eight pounds I was catching in the same day really opened my eyes to, to the true unlocking power of a big, big bait, okay? But even I would have just told you like, dude, that's not gonna work here. Like, we don't have those fish. And I'm telling you guys right now that might be thinking that, you absolutely have these fish, okay? And, and especially early on with the swim bait. I'm sorry, man, I'll, I'll try harder next time. Are you sure? Can I bribe you to stay? The, the numbers uh, of these big fish was um, very lopsided. And, and even those guys that I still continue to fish against at home and in a friendly manner, um, most people tend to like me in person, usually. Thank you. Thank you guys uh, for not picking on me. Kind of sensitive. Um, it was pretty amazing that I would outfish these guys with a big bait. And those guys are literally drop shotting with like four pound line or split shotting with this little finesse worm. And I'm getting fish to travel 10, 20, 30 feet off of their prime ambush positions to engage with a big meal and a big opportunity. So jerkbait fishing was really key for me back in the day because I could catch a lot of aggressive fish. I could ask those fish a myriad of different questions to really dial into a bite. And two of the biggest concepts that you should really be paying attention to are rhythm and cadence because those two things directly correspond to that big eye slide. All right, so I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna ask this question. And my, my first question usually starts with kind of a standard rhythm and cadence. That's a rip, pause, rip, rip, pause, rip, 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 pause, rip, pause, and then I'll start making adjustments, right? I ask that question those five to 10 times I'll go fish a flat that looks good. It should hold some fish or I've located some stuff on the electronics or I see them visually, some kind of confirmation. Okay, I'm gonna ask those questions. And if I don't get a bite, I'm gonna keep changing my question slightly. Some days, it's like, man, do you think they'll eat it on just a straight twitch, 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 twitch? And that fish was kind of interested right there. Look when I stop it. Okay, that's a little bit more positive enforcement. And I'm gonna continue changing my question. What is this guy doing, taking a bath? Maybe they want it in the current. Maybe that white water is a key to trigger them to bite because of the lack of visibility. But the, the versatility in how you can present this bait is its greatest strength. And we used to be kind of limited in the jerk bait styles and models. Thankfully, it's 2020. We've got a lot of evolution and variation um, that we can utilize to continue asking these kind of questions all the way down to different color finishes, diving depths. Oh, hook up. Anybody ever do that before? I've done it when I've hooked up to a fish, jumping up and down on the deck. It happens. For some reason, that question, or that series of questions I was asking, didn't generate the yes. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna use a snap to quickly change, not stand up here awkwardly trying to retie like I was yesterday just like I am in the water and keep a bait in the water. And I'm gonna ask a slightly different question. Same bait, same color actually, but this is the standard Tennessee Shad. And what's the difference there? It's as subtle as having a, nat uh, a normal flashy clear coat finish that catches a lot of light versus that first one I was throwing, which is a new matte pattern. A little bit more subdued, a little bit more mellow, doesn't throw as much light, but hey, maybe these fish want to see the light. So I'm going to ask those fish another series of questions. Do you like the flash? 
of the Tennessee Shad. Oh, he likes it a little bit more than the last series of questions. It's okay, now do, do I gotta ask a different question is, maybe they want it completely suspended and not moving. Is that gonna trigger a bite, especially in the colder water up here? All right, you guys that fish jerk baits in the Northeast, you guys are known for long pauses. Kind of wild to a young Oliver Nye to think that I can make a cast with a hunk of plastic and literally not move it for up to 30, 40 seconds and expect a fish to be fooled by that. But I learned that from the great Al Lidner on an infisherman show one time. I'd wake up like at 4.30 in the morning on a Saturday because in the West Coast they got no love for us. It was TNN Outdoors back then. And I took somebody else's experience and perspective from a whole different part of the country. And I was like, well, for us, February's kind of cold, right? I got to put a sweater on once in a while. Maybe that could work where I live. Sorry, I like to rib you guys about the weather every chance I get. But I actually tried uh, with a TD minnow back then, because back then that was the juice. $17.99 for a jerk bait. Like, man, I thought I was balling. All right, like, look at me, I got a TD minnow. And I was out there, cold water for us is probably in the low 50s. And sure enough, you know, I, I, I altered my, my basic. I swear I do this for a living. I changed my basic question, right? The rip, 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 pause. And just extended that pause and literally would not move it for a 30 count. And the trick that I learned from Al Lidner on that one was to accommodate the drag from the monofilament line back then, because it actually will sink and kind of drag and actually pull that bait ever so slowly to you, is that you just actually want to barely turn the handle just to keep that slack out of your line. Now you become a line watcher. Who here loves watching a bobber go down? Oh, come on, who doesn't love watching a bobber go down? Okay, those fundamental, fundamental experiences translate to now I'm line watching with this really bright braid. I'm looking for a visual affirmation because a lot of times on that jerkbait bite in cold water, you're not feeling that tick, but surprisingly you do a lot of times. And sure enough, just keeping the slack out of the line, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, there's no way this is gonna work. Three, 1,000, four, 1,000, all the way up to 30, I think 46 seconds or something was my record. And all of a sudden, tick, you have gotta be kidding me. Uh, fish on. It's, it's pretty wild. And it's a very versatile bait. You guys notice here like this bait with, this, with the hooks barely kind of cut off has affected the suspending action of these baits. A lot of them are designed to suspend out of the package, but you can adjust that one way or another with all kinds of things. Where the addition of a snap can affect the way that bait sits and falls and rises. You can add lead strips, dots, adhesive weights, you can put a bigger gauge hook. You can put lighter gauge hooks to get it to, what, to, get it to act in the manner that's gonna trigger that yes response. And, and believe it or not, I actually prefer my jerk baits to sink a little bit. Like I don't really care too much about a truly suspending bait because I feel I'm able to present this lure that is gaining quickly in popularity because people are starting to see the power of the jerk bait and the 110 in particular, especially if you're fishing against a buddy that's got one. Like, man, I better get on that train because it's starting to catch some fish. My, those fish are being conditioned. All right, bass fishing is a very unique activity in that these fish are getting multiple opportunities to learn with us. Every time they make a mistake, we abduct them from their homes temporarily, throw them in our bass boats, take pictures of the gram, and then release them and expect them to get bigger and, and want to you know, join that party all over again. Gets a little, little taxing on them, so they become more timid. Now that range where they're used to seeing jerk baits now isn't as effective as before. So I can take either a sinking version of that that I've modified by myself or just a stock bait in a plus two which is designed to dive up to 12 to 15 feet. Now we got a, a whole new zone that these fish potentially haven't been accustomed to seeing this bait and I'm catching them all over again. I'm really surprised that these fish up here haven't been crushing this thing every cast. You can trigger a lot of reaction strikes from these fish. Generally, the warmer the water, the faster I can get away with going. See how wild that action is? Literally, 
I could probably do this enough to just start pissing them off and they're gonna strike it out of aggression and anger. Like that's a real thing. Like that's a real thing. I'm gonna be that a kid that just asks all those annoying questions over and over and over. And really actually the adults are probably more guilty of that than the kids are. But you can trigger and elicit different kinds of strikes from fish. When fish are hungry and they're feeding, they're frankly not that hard to fool. Like just about anything will work within reason. Uh, the feeding response is an easy one to trigger, but it's really the rest of that fish's day where it's a challenge to get them to open their mouth on it. And the fact that they don't have hands or feet to attack something and they're left with utilizing their mouth opens up a whole new bevy of ways to trigger a strike. Literally, you can annoy the crap out of these fish, especially these very territorial fish, especially these bigger dominant fish. Okay, you can get in their face, you can uh, throw the brightest colors. Have you guys seen like some of those clown colors? You guys familiar with that color? Um, I don't have one with me, but it's like a bright chartreuse, orange belly, red head, white sides, it's just loud. It's, it literally, literally looks like a clown. And they're definitely not eating that thing out of hunger, in my opinion, because it doesn't match the hatch. It doesn't look like anything natural in the water, but it's a big, loud presence, and they just got to kill it. It works especially well in the spring. What are these fish doing in the spring a lot of times? They've got a defensive behavior of guarding their nests, okay? So whether or not you actually see that fish, a lot of those spring fish you're catching on these reaction baits and loud, obnoxious baits are actually bed fish defending their nests. Just because you didn't realize that it was sitting on a bed and guarding it doesn't mean that you're not going through and actually catching those same fish. But you can be efficient and just cover a lot of water and fish this thing fast like you saw me do. Just rip, rip, rip and go down the bank and, and, and really eliminate big stretches of unproductive water, but quickly hopefully find good stretches, small stretches of water that are holding the fish. I rely on these three lures heavily when I'm trying to piece the puzzle of a new body of water. And then from those learning experiences that I'm still going through now, I can then upscale. It's like, okay, they tend to like the grass on this lake. That lake, man, they really relate to the wood. So I can kind of focus my efforts in those right locations. It's, it's really uh, an ever-changing puzzle. That's what I feel makes fishing really, really special. The learning never stops. And just when uh, we all figure that we got it figured out, <laughs> you go out there, super pump, invite your buddies, hire the cameraman. I got this thing dialed. We're gonna shoot an epic day of fishing and go out there and catch absolutely nothing. Happens all the time. Because we, what, we, what we don't realize is those external factors that are affecting the uh, behavior of these fish, it's always changing. You can't fish the past. You can't fish what happened last weekend. You can't fish your 25 to 30 pound bag that you shook off uh, the day before the tournament because something changed. And one of those big changes that people don't account for, it could be as simple as something as moon phase. Right? Literally the moon phase is never the same. So you should be going into every fishing outing with an open mind, using high engagement lures to get as much of that information as possible, and then make, uh, make better decisions. And right now I'm using my experience from the last day and a half here of being on this tank to realize that if I throw that eye slide without an adjustment, it's probably gonna sit a little too high for number one, you guys to see it working, and number two, get it in that middle to bottom zone where these fish are really responding to all this fake stuff I'm throwing at their face. So I'm actually gonna take this little pinch on weight here and you can find a bunch of dope little knick-knack accessories at uh, Lee's Global Tackle. They're a leading importer of JDM, just custom like doohickeys, like this little grenade shaped weight. I can literally just clip it onto the bottom of this bait here and now Actually, I should just show you guys without the, the weight, what it does. Now, you're probably gonna have a hard time seeing a demonstration right now, right? And for the most part, those fish aren't really responding to that right now. It's still kind of cold. 
They're not super aggressive unless you're throwing an Okashira screw head. So I'm actually just gonna make that adjustment on the water, put a clip, and see. I don't even know. Yeah, enough to get it to sink. I'm sorry? Oh, the question is, what am I clipping the weight onto? It's just the, the belly hook hanger. See how quick of an adjustment that was? Pretty easy, right? But now I can get this bait down to a zone. Uh, some of you guys aren't, aren't as young as the other ones. You guys remember the old countdown series of Rapalas? Okay, that's a concept that a lot of people don't even talk about or acknowledge or understand. I'm doing the same thing with those st small jerk baits. I'm putting heavier hooks on them and I'm getting this same effect of taking a suspending bait and actually getting it to sink. So I'm actually fishing spots a lot of times behind people and I'll go behind these guys, racking them on the jerk bait. I'll count it down past where I know their suspending baits aren't getting to. Now I'm exposed my bait to a whole new demographic of fish. And I'm doing that all the way up to all these guide baits too. Okay, so cadence and retrieve. None of this is my tackle, that's my excuse. Okay, I'm gonna sink it down, count it down. I'm gonna play with that rhythm. One glide, pause, two glides, pause, three glides, pause. And actually, I was hitting it way too hard there, especially with this braided line. I don't have the stretch that I normally have. Oh boy, oh boy, here we go. What are you doing, musky fishing? No man, I'm bass fishing, what are you doing? You guys see the similar? Oh boy. Come on, just do it. Just do it. Be a hero. Get it before your buddy does. I'm keeping that fish's attention on the bait and not on the fact that this weird kid from California is twirling an eight inch piece of plastic over their heads. You'd be amazed at how much you can get these fish to focus on this thing and ignore everything else. Two of them ate it like that yesterday. Here, you guys missed it, it was pretty cool. But those lessons that I learned from that fundamental jerkbait fishing co totally come into play. And even now, I'm able to get a positive response to get you guys even more intrigued by making that little adjustment, asking a slightly different question. And actually, I can fish this bait a lot faster too. At first, when I first started fishing this bait, I honestly didn't kind of like it because I felt like I had to fish it super slow because of its floating nature. And, I, and with this simple modification, and the modifications can be endless. I'm, I'm able to actually fish this thing fast and aggressive and in a whole new manner that even other swim baiters, Texas, California, Arizona, other places, <laughs> man, uh, just aren't used to seeing. And here, here's, some, here's some food for thought, guys. Most predator fish are fully capable of eating a prey item one third their body size. I'd say that's about right here, right? You got pound and a half to three pound fish, seven and a half inch bait, that's roughly a third. They have no problem eating a big bait or what many of us consider a big bait. Get that out of your heads. These things are eating each other, juvenile bass. Uh, here's a question to ponder. Anybody in here ever see a little carp? Really? I never see little carp. And I surmise that the only reason you see big ones is because all the little ones get eaten. They're slimy, so they probably slide down the gullet a little bit easier. They don't have any spines. I got my man all the way from Britain. A lot of carp fishing there, right? Good thing you guys don't have bass because a lot of your carp probably wouldn't make it to those monster sizes. And I'm gonna take lessons that I learned and more importantly, the confidence from stepping up from a standard jerk bait to a small mid-size glide bait here I'm gonna go out there and really give it, give it heck. Um, yeah, actually this rod is gonna work, but now I've gotta make adjustments. All right, this is a 10 and a third inch bait, six ounces in weight. It's a whole different animal here. So you need to step up your line size, you need to step up your rod size, you need to step up your reel size, all right? I gotta, a uh, Mega Bass Destroyer. I think this is an eight power rod. Daiwa Lexa 300. Uh, it's got up to 22 pounds of drag so I can lock that drag down and control these fish when I can hopefully make them make that mistake. 
I can accurately and effectively present or cast and then present this bait and then capitalize on that momentary lapse in judgment by the biggest fish in this tank and the biggest fish in this lake. Let's see what happens when I just drop a big bait in the water like I've been doing with the smaller baits. Swim baits and big baits in particular have a, a unique effect in that their size actually draws a lot of attention just all on its own. I can't really see it in the white rod water. Did you guys notice how it just kind of slowly drifted down? These are unique in that I can actually adjust the tuning on these things as well and get them to perfectly suspend. All right, so I can actually glide the bait, pause it, and count, and use that same mechanic of barely keeping my line tight as that bait kind of drifts, and wait for that tick. I'm jerkbait fishing. You see the correlations here? But hopefully these things are just super angry and aggro and I can go out there and make long bomb casts and I can fish this thing aggressively. Sorry, I'm still not 100% proficient with, <laughs> oh boy, uh, with the left hand reel, I'm about 97, 98%. So working on my left hand finishes, you know, um, as I am with my right hand. So that, that affects my ability to articulate this lure. I, got, I put a lot of English on it. Any of you guys that have played basketball in the past, seen the guy that specializes in that reverse layup, right? He's got to put a spin on the ball and get that ball to kick off a weird part of the glass and right into the bucket. I'm doing a lot of the same thing with this lure, with the combination of the rod, the reel. I'm putting English on the bait to affect the way that this thing is swimming. It's a really fun way to catch him. Heads up, you'd be amazed how many times that action landing on top of a fish, especially a big one, triggers a response to just attack it. You know, if you ever had a, a game of uh, let's scare the little brother in the hallway, it got a punch in the face at a reaction. I think that's happening a lot with these fish. You spook them like, oh dude, what the heck? And they just strike it out of that instant uh, splashdown. So you always gotta be ready. Okay, but I'm gonna play with this cadence. I'm gonna start fast, see if it can trigger a bite. Oh, look how much these fish are willing to move. These guys aren't even the real deal. I've watched big, big bass come 10, 20, 30 feet. That's not embarrassing at all. To, to come get one of these baits. Okay, maybe there's a learning opportunity here. Is there any fish coming up to investigate this commotion? Dang it. I had a pep talk with these guys before the show. Apparently they're not on board anymore. Well, typically what happens when you're snagged, hopefully below the surface, is that flailing frantic action is creating noise, it's creating a disturbance, and it's drawing the curiosity of these predators. So I'm, even now, I'm in no big hurry to run over there and unstick this lure, even though it's a super expensive bait and I'm worried about losing it because I've understood from a lot of those fundamental mistakes with the smaller bait, when I get hung up, that bait's still flailing around and I'll probably demonstrate it with that little dark sleeper. When you're snagged and you're doing all of this, man, that bait's acting really peculiar. It's, it's really um, appealing to that sense of curiosity and how many of you guys have had the experience of being snagged and doing this only to have it turn into a fish all of a sudden? Yeah, isn't it cool? Those are like bonus fish, right? I used to think of them as bonus fish, but the learning opportunity there was, well, if that's how I'm triggering bites, why don't I try getting snagged on purpose? Hmm, and I was able to do that because I was um, smart enough, I hope, to buy two different lure retrievers one on the telescopic pole, $54.99 for a bill on Amazon, free shipping, get prime, it's worth it. Um, and then a rope string, uh, rope lure retriever that I can drop past that 15 feet. Between those two, I'm getting 95 to 98% of my lures back. So I can actually afford to be that brazen and put that bait in, in, in harm's way and really expose myself to a high percent. Oh, look at that. About time. Thank you and really give my shot 
uh, myself a shot at a really good chance of catching a fish. It, it's kind of wild. People have a tendency to, to make that mistake and like, oh man, I, I'm snagged. I, I, let's go over there. Go get my bait. Like, no man, just chill out. Take a breather and, you know, have a little finesse in your game. And the funny thing is, like, there aren't any hook points on this thing. Yeah, there we go. But see, I didn't go and spook the spot. I was able to take my time, keep you guys distracted long enough for me to get that thing off. Now I'm back fishing. And you'd be amazed as soon as that thing pops off the snag, boom, they crush it. So like I said, let's go back to that fundamental concept and prove it with a higher engagement lure. Problem is, a lot of these baits actually um, come through cover almost too good. So like this bait here actually has um, a dorsal fin that covers the hook. You see there's no exposed hook. So it actually comes through cover too good sometimes. All right, doesn't really snag in the rocks. Doesn't really get hung in the wood. So that's good for fishability. All right, you can fire this thing into some pretty thick cover and get it back. But there are times when you, to get a, a bite, to trigger a bite, I literally want to do my best, if these fish will let me, get it on the backside of this log or a small rock pile and then wedge it. Don't bite it, don't bite it, okay? These guys just, we're not on the same page, man. I gotta work on my pep talk. But imagine this thing being kind of stuck on that rock and rocking back and forth, and I'm able to actually keep it on the backside of that piece of cover without pulling it out of there. And it's just gonna aggravate them and aggravate them. And those of you guys that sat in on my first seminar might have heard my Dave Chappelle reference. One of my favorite episodes, Prince, White Couch, Charlie Murphy, Rick James. Okay, you're creating that scenario. You got your muddy boots all over that brand new white couch. People don't appreciate it and the fish don't appreciate it. So you can do the same thing here and build confidence in that crazy, crazy thought process works through a high engagement lure, like a little dark sleeper. And then you can emulate that with anything. And just, it really doesn't matter what you're snagged with. Next time, do yourselves a favor, don't be in a rush and, and have a little finesse in your game. Try the, uh, the old guitar string pluck, you know, raw tip high, a little bit of slack line. Like that's a really good way to get it. <laughs> really guys, come on. Oh yeah, this is going down. I'm gonna handline one of these. Ugh. I'm gonna catch one of, sh one of Shane's fish here without hooking it. I, I promise I won't hurt its feelings, Shane. Oh, now you guys don't wanna play. Come on, come on. All right, I'm gonna work my way up there. Okay, this is one of those baits that you literally can't fish wrong. As you saw, I wasn't even trying to actually present this bait. And these fish will eat it. See that? It, it sits perfectly on the bottom, a lot like those sculpin and gobies do. I've got the attention of all these fish. I can dart it around. Those of you guys that are fishing out of boats and still running uh, that ancient technology of 2D sonar and not fishing live scope, you guys ever see like a fish come under the cone of the transducer? Right, those things are literally dropping or swimming through underneath your feet. This is a bait that you can literally just drop on their heads. Uh, one of the things I do when I'm fishing is I'll have a bait like this wound up to the tip so that when I'm going down the bank with a jerk bait or something and all of a sudden, oh, hey, look at that. I can actually just put down the other rod and it depends where you are because like in California, you can't fish more than two rods without a second rod stamp. So make sure you're legal where you are because you can't do this everywhere. But I'll literally have that thing ready to go and just drop it on their heads because you got a small window of opportunity. You catch a lot of bonus fish that way. Good question. The question was, did I have to put a weight in it or did I put one in there? And here I'm actually going to pitch it over to you. Okay, you can inspect it. All right, now should I ask this question, do I swing or do I wind? And it's actually an internal lead head. Okay, the lead weight is encompassed by the soft plastic. So it's all one unit. So when those fish do make that commitment, you guys saw, typically they're holding on. They're not really getting any negative cues. 
it is not scented. So you can add to that by adding your own scent of your choice. So I highly recommend using scent on anything soft plastic in nature. Uh, it really just convinces them to hold on to it more than I feel that it convinces them to make the bite and the commitment. Does that make sense? Like it may be triggering a bite or two, but it really excels when they actually commit to the lure. And they're getting that positive enforcement from the taste. Like I said, uh, crawfish, shad, bluegill, you can match the hatch if you want. I've used trout scent on jigs. It, I, I think we give these things too much credit sometimes. If it tastes good, like, oh man, this little goby tastes like a shad. This is totally wrong. Yeah. That doesn't happen. Follow up question? I use Bass Dynasty scent. And like I said, pick one that you like. If, if, you're, if you think you're throwing a shad pattern, pick shad. If you think you're throwing a minnow pattern, pick minnow. Um, if you like Italian food, pick garlic. It's pretty amazing what these fish will respond to. And, and f please, I encourage you guys to uh, ask any questions and engage with me here while you can. Uh, man, you know, Justin Pirelli, I want to make sure I understand the question again before I answer it. Okay, so the question is, what is the lowest temperature range uh, I've effectively fished a glide bait? And it's funny because after I shown the Pirelli boys a little glimpse of this in like late fall, uh, they kept continuing to fish into ice. And I got that exact same question. Say, hey man, like how do you present a glide bait in 37 degree water? I'm like, bro, I'm California, I don't know. We don't get 37 degree water. So he had to go out there and take a little bit of the insight I showed him and have to put in the hard work and figure it out himself, right? And ask those bevy of questions and just try. But I believe uh, 37 degrees, was that correct, Aaron? Was the coldest that he was actually able to catch a glide bait fish on? Okay, so like high 30s, seems pretty cold to me. So excellent question. Um, you got a question? Or you're just stretching. <laughs> I knew you were stretching. It's all good. Uh, anyways, if you guys haven't already, please subscribe uh, to the Big Bass Streams channel. I started my own channel as well. Uh, the, the Big Bass Streams channel is going to feature more guys like your local talent here, doing exactly this in the Northeast. There's a, a ton of content that we've been able to capture and thankfully share with you guys. Uh, hopefully if I come back next year, there will be more success stories that may have stemmed from your time spent with me today. Um, and if you're a little shy, come up and ask these questions uh, in the privacy of a one-on-one -on -one interaction. My name is Oliver Knight. Thank you guys for uh, stopping through. Taking our flight, I'm using all of my might securely taming the fight. No, no 